this particular paper, um, it's a little tough because, um, uh, you know, uh, many concepts are in confusion now. Um, uh, concepts need to be um, updated, uh, revalued, reframed. And uh, by the time one concept or one theory is established, the realities change. So it's always a race, you know, to balance the theory with reality. Uh, feminism is uh, uh, one of such uh, uh, movements, philosophy, ideology, uh, and a survival strategy. Um, actually, uh, this particular paper, uh, which the title is given to me, Ecofeminism and its Concerns, um, I have actually framed the paper um, as a theoretical paper. Uh, before I start the paper, let me apologize to the participants uh, for not making adequate and you know sufficient corrections in the paper. I, I did it in a hurry, and uh, you know COVID times uh, prevent us from um, uh, excellent uh, office support, the typing support, and. Uh, in my old age, I think I'm not going to learn typing anymore, although I manage typing. So uh, sorry for the, for the errors, but you can always ask me if there's been a confusion due to the errors. And I promise Professor Hebar that uh, once you are ready for your publication of the book, I will certainly give you a fully corrected version. Let me begin. I'm just leaving the, the, the um, uh, sort of motto like dialogue that I have placed at the beginning. I'll come to that during the course of my paper. I begin. As a combination of the two terms, ecology and feminism, ecofeminism is as much an environmental discourse of feminism as a feminist discourse of environmentalism. Ernst Haeckel, the German biologist who coined the term ecology in the mid 19th century, conceived it as a worldview, as a philosophy that accepted the totality of an organism. With all organisms, it comes into contact, both animate and inanimate, dispelling the Descartian anthropocentric view of the human being as a subject privileged and destined to control and own the earth in its entirety as object. So this is something basic to the concept. Man as a ruling you know, emperor, like a car in our sitting in nature and controlling the movements of the nature. This was questioned by the concept of ecology. Not so, we are all related beings, both animate animals and human beings and the plants, the flora and the fauna we are one, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vitally related world. So this was the, the, the concept that was brought forward by Ernst Haeckel, the German biologist. I go ahead and ecofeminism. Ecofeminism confronts and critiques the domination of men over nature and pleads for an egalitarian bonding, negating the hierarchical structure of superiority of the human over nature as a dominable and consumable commodity. So uh, we have actually two liberational, uh, revolutionary, radical theories side by side combining together. That is ecofeminism. Feminism spoke for the uh, relatedness, equality of woman with every being, not only man with every being, everything in the world. Ecology also pleads for a simultaneity, interrelated as communion, you know, uh, uh, irreversible uh, relationship with the surroundings, nature. Ecology came to be popularized as a combined socio-economic and biological study in the 60s to examine how the human use of nature is causing pollution of soil, air, and water, the destruction of the natural life system of plants and animals, threatening 
the base of life upon which the human community depends. As we all know, you know, uh, technology, industrialization, development, all of which, you know, and also urbanization, all these things did interfere with the health of nature, the sustainability of nature. So ecology actually became popular, particularly because in the 60s, you know, this race after development, race after industrialization, and the mad race after technology had already started. Although in India, it came a little late, even mobile phones came late, but once we got it, you know, sky is the limit. Okay, now uh, I'm also asking you if I'm too fast or if you want, if you want me to slow down, I can always do, uh, am I okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. Tangamani. Now, <clears throat> deep ecology. I'm so happy that the Professor Matsun yesterday referred to deep ecology and also ecofeminism. Deep ecology is deeper. It's deeper than ecology. Deep ecology moves from a criticism or critique of the social and technological destruction, devastation of nature. It goes further from there into the symbolic, psychological, and cultural patterns by which the humans have distanced themselves from nature and replaced themselves from as part of it to the ruler, possessor, and dominator. So deep ecology actually very seriously addresses this question of how dare you human being, you claim to be the monopolizer, the possessor, the ruler, the dictator of nature. So it actually becomes more serious and deeper and replace themselves as I mean, uh, uh, not ruler, but you're a part of it. Deep ecology proposes an ecological healing. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a curative you know, kind of a uh, philosophy, ecological healing that will lead to a psycho-cultural, spiritual conversion from the anthropocentric stance of separation and domination into a communion in nature through an interconnected community of life. So the anthropocentric view says man as the subject and nature as the object. You behave, I, I can control, I can build dams, I can change the directions of rivers, I can stop the rivers. Uh, so this kind of a claim that is being, you know, countered by the deep ecology theory. I have also quoted a Rosemary Radford Ruther uh, in this connection. Feminism is an equally complex concept and practice that protests against the age-old domination of man over woman, patriarchy, and affirms the need and rights of women for a relationship of equality between man and woman. This we all know, almost generally we know that it is actually a cry, a lament um, uh, for, uh, for the removal of the inequality, both in attitude and in practice, the equality that exists between man and woman, particularly the unkind, unethical domination of man over woman in every walk of life. Ecofeminism views the relationship between human beings and nature and the relationship between man and woman as characterized by hegemony and exploitative use by a patriarchally oriented society. So there is actually a paralleling of the relationship between nature and human being and woman and man. Nature equals, is equal to woman and man is equal to um, uh, civilization, culture, urbanization, etc. So ecofeminism views the relationship between uh, human beings and nature and the relationship between man and woman as characterized by hegemony, you know, the tendency to rule over, the tendency to monopolize, the tendency to dictate um, and also exploit, the exploitative use by a patriarchally oriented society. 
patriarchy is a very loaded word loaded word it is not merely you know the domination of man or woman it is a whole body of attitudes it is a tradition it's a history it's a social um, uh, it, it's a, it's a social complex actually so both ecology and feminism both ecology and feminism indulge in a radical critique of the unjust domination unequal separatism and merciless possessiveness prevailing in nature and in social life so if man if feminism addresses the inequality the domination of man over woman in social life ecology ecology actually addresses uh, this unjust domination of the human being over nature so both together both come together the term ecofeminism was coined by the as it was mentioned by professor matsun yesterday the term ecofeminism was coined by the french left wing thinker ecologist and feminist uh, philosopher francois de abord in 1974 forgive me for the uh, uh, wrong probably french pronunciation it is f r a n c o i s c b uh, apostrophe abord e a u b o n e in 1974 she used it as a loaded term to describe a philosophical movement backed by a transformative politics so it is not merely a, a theoretical thing you know there was a politics behind that she wanted to change she pleaded for a change it was a transformative politics ecofeminism considers ecological issues as feminist issues as well so that is where you know the the, the combination comes Uh, ecology is not merely uh, it is not it cannot be confined to a an abstract uh, neutral uh, asexual kind of a thing it is charged with feminist issues as well it is deep ecology and belongs to the third wave of feminism it is an environmentalism from the woman's perspective and experience a mutual impregnation between environmentalism and feminism so pleading for environment and pleading for environ women come together ecofeminism can counters the sexist arrogance and unscrupulous invasiveness of the baconian concept francis bacon all of us have learned reading make it a full man you know all these definitions we always you know glory over uh, the wise sayings of bacon but not so by the feminists because uh, here is his uh, uh, statement the baconic concept nature is a woman waiting to be raped nature is a woman waiting to be raped poor man he didn't mean that much the so bad thing you know such a bad thing about women for him his concentration was actually on exploration discovering new lands uh, scientific experiments uh to to look into the to nature the the mysteries of nature uh open up them unload the mister uh, the earth of its mysteries just like just like be flowering a woman uh so he used this very unkind statement which angered feminists all over the world nature is a woman waiting to be raped pekin said that the anthropocentric and utilitarian attitude to nature that is the man centered man as subject that particular attitude anthropocentric and utilitarian attitude exploiting the resources of nature utilitarian attitude to nature is challenged by ecofeminism it criticizes the excessive importance given by modernism to rationality and development an anti mechanistic and anti consumerist view that derides that condemns the present development rhetoric is a significant component of its epistemology so we are so happy you know technology and we we tell the students you know particularly for entrance examination logical thinking rational approach all these things so we are all the you know we we are the promoters of this kind of rationality but ecofeminism actually um, questions this 
absolute dependence on rationality. It opposes technomania, which distances human beings from nature. It does, it does not exactly you know, oppose technology, but technomania, the madness, the, the craze after technology, craze after a, of a develop, or craze after development, which is based on technology. The failure and unsustainability of the techno-economic development model is evidenced by climate change, landslides, repeated unpredictable occurrence of floods, and global warming. As we now know, you know, the world is now just looking forward to Glasgow, where the climate summit is going on. And Greta, that little girl, how she rocked the world with her, you know, with her condemnation of all the systems in the world, which actually stand together to exploit nature. So this is a, this is a, the right time for, you know, addressing this issue. Uncaring and irresponsible interventions in the life and continuity of nature rob the biosphere of its spontaneous growth and sustenance. What happens to nature because of the selfish and dominating forces of male political and economic power happens to women through misogyny and oppression. So what woman suffers is equal to what nature suffers. And in both, according to ecofeminism, Hegemonic patriarchy, patriarchy constitutes the basic premise, the basic uh, aspect, uh, the basic uh, foundation of ecofeminist discourse. Quote, the ecofeminists believe that women interact with the environment in a spiritual, nurturing, and intuitive manner. As a result of women's close association with the environment, their domination and oppression has occurred in conjunction with the domination and degradation of the environment. Uh, this is by Brownian James. I've, I've given the reference at the end of the paper. Now, you see, uh, the, the idea is this, that when nature is inflicted upon cruelly, when nature is harmed, when nature is destroyed, it is the woman who suffers the most because woman is the closest to nature for her survival, for her caring, for all her activities. So when you touch nature unkindly, you actually not only touch, you almost kill the woman. So this kind of a paradigmatic relationship is the basic in the, the foundational aspect of ecofeminism. Women are not only the first victims of environmental deterioration, but also play a key role in the defense of nature. Ecofeminism is the thought and praxis that addresses this double-sided issue. That woman is not only the victim of uh, uh, the victim of the consequences of destroying nature, but she's also a warrior, a soldier in the fight against all forces that destroy nature. The Western philosophy of dualism. Uh, that is something, you know, uh, very important to us. As Indians, we know that um, we believe in, you know, Aham Brahmasmi, you know, Nidha um, Nanyan, you and I, you know, in fact, we believe that the salvation lies in the, in the blending, in the merging of the Egatma into Paramatma. Actually, Indian philosophy, the whole course of Indian philosophy, actually, is, uh, is, is a mission to destroy this duality, this kind of a divisiveness. The Western philosophy, on the other hand, is, is one of dualism and separates humans and nature into two binaries that is contested by ecofeminism. Ecofeminism attacks this. As we know, you know, we have the, the tradition of asking the permission of the trees. Can we cut you? 
So that is a kind of, and we, we know the, the tradition of our rishis, you know, our sages who lived in the forest, who lived in close communion with the, with the trees, you know, with the, with the birds and animals. For what? For becoming more scholarly, for becoming more human, for becoming, you know, sages. So this kind of a, a philosophy of dualism, it calls for a, ecofeminism calls for a holistic vision of human beings within environment and a healthy egalitarian, based on equality, egalitarian system of dynamic interrelatedness. In such a system, women are also liberated from the subservient, slavish and exploited condition created by patriarchy that operates in every aspect of living, including government, educational system, commerce, religion, and family. This we all know that this, this kind of a, an exploitative you know, uh, trajectory. Ecofeminism is a vision of restoration of the damaged ecosystems from an endangered world simultaneously with the acquisition of freedom and dignity of the female self and the recognition of her power and relevance on a par with the male. So there is a twin mission, a twin aim. If nature has to be retrieved from the exploitative forces, the woman also needs to be given the kind of dignity and relevance in the whole scheme of things. Ecofeminism disapproves the age old identification of the male with culture and woman with the nature. So th this is a kind of you know, traditional thing, uh, development, progress, modernity, all with men, uh, but you know, traditional, conservative, not so clever, not so intelligent as uh, like nature, like unpruned nature, you know, woman. It interrogates, but ecofeminism interrogates questions, such a culture where apparent the agents of development like reason, science, technology, mechanization, urbanization, etc., are wielded by a power structure dominated by men as authority and majority. Because not many people are, not many women are actually involved in decision making, involved in technology. Um, the identification of women with earth or nature is caused due to several factors. I'm just mentioning a few. One, the biological entity of woman, the physiology of woman, which has got a psych cyclical nature, which is relatable to nature's cycle. Vasandam, you know, Shishiram, Grishmam, you know, the kind of cycle, cyclical moment. Two, the woman's close contact with nature because she's interested with the responsibility of nurturing the family, vis-a-vis -vis cooking, gardening, housekeeping, farming, child rearing, cleaning, etc. So she is the closest to nature. So women are in greater need of natural resources than men. Three, a cultural belief that women have intuitive link with nature. And we have we have goddesses, you know, we have many deities which are always, you know, placed uh, in in uh, not only in contact, you know, in a devotional relationship with nature. Uh, we can almost call a part of nature sometimes deity and pray. We have Naga concept. You know, we have so we have so many, you know, very intimate concepts, beliefs, faith systems, uh, which actually establish this kind of an intimate relationship between woman and nature. Four, biologically, the right side of the brain, which generates and guides emotions, is more active in women, whereas the left side of the brain which is identified with logical thinking, reasoning, and analytical ability is more functional in men. Oh, this is God's doing. So we start crying very fast. Um, we are very sentimental people, but men very strong, very critical, very analytical. You know, there, there, is a, there is a biological you know, uh, uh, reality behind the whole thing. Hence, the various changes and fluctuations in the activities and expressions of nature are established as similar to the emotional faculty of women who pass through different stages of life, each loaded with associated feelings. For example, menstruation, wifehood, 
pregnancy, motherhood, etc. All these we can relate to some of the movements and developments and happenings in nature. And that's why, you know, I have not gone into that. That's why writers uh, always, you know, uh, personify uh, the objects and movements of nature. And uh, uh, eyes are related to lotus, uh, compared to lotus and nose to water. So this kind of, a, uh, uh, you know, similarity or uh, mirroring of the features of nature in the entity of women. Five. Women are affected the worst by environmental deterioration, endangering the health of the earth through pollution, etc., has the most harmful impact on women's health and reproductive health. That we know, you know, when there is an atmospheric pollution, pregnant women are affected the most. It is, it is also reflected, you know, in the health of the child. Many cases of infant mortality are related to atmospheric pollution. We know that. So there is a paradoxical, at the same time, there is a paradoxical dimension in the relationship between technology and women. Because um, I know that many ladies on in this group have been able to come to attend, I mean, they've been able to attend this webinar at 9.30 because they have a fridge, because they have a microwave, because they have a mixie, you know, all kinds of technology supported gadgets in their kitchen. So how do we turn our back to technology is a big question. This is in simple terms, you know. There is a paradoxical dimension in the relationship between technology and women. Technology has contributed immensely to lessening the physical hardships of women by providing them with plenty of gadgets and facilities, household utensils, transport facilities, communication tools, and many more in this category have speeded up women's activities and made living easier for them. So some of you probably have, you know, early in the mornings uh, talked to uh, the children abroad in the United States or seen them really on the screen and, or gone, on, uh, gone in for a, a video conferencing. Even this is made possible. Uh, many of you have not probably um, got, into, got into your uh, party clothes. You're still in your household, you know, domestic dress, but you can attend this, you know, national seminar. This is technology, uh, communication, um, but only some classes of women in society are the benefactors of this advantage. Not all, not everybody. Women in third world countries, especially in Africa and the rural parts of India are ignored in this so-called technological revolution. Technology has robbed the earth of its natural resources in a massive manner making even the facilities that it has provided unsustainable. The Toronto bond, you have to continue. We have to, you have to go on, I mean, you have to sustain it. That is where, you know, the, the real problem arises. Human greed for amassing wealth has led to the exploitation of nature by using technology irresponsibly and unethically, which amounts to technomania. Both nature and women are losers in this development model which is the fabrication of male-driven capitalist strategies, ecofeminism, in projecting an ideological opposition to such a development discourse is inevitably socialist, anti-capitalist, and anti-patriarchal. So it is, it is, it is, it is anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, it is socialist in content, in, in, in philosophy, uh, in ideology, and also anti-patriarchal against all domine uh, domineering uh, attitude of man. If strands of counter-development narrative, counter-development, if there is a tendency to um, uh, call a halt to or stop the um, fast race of development, you can not blame, it is there in ecofeminism. If strands of counter-development narrative, anti-modernist attitude, and anti-rationality are found in eco-feminist concept. It cannot be dismissed as baseless. It is there. Eco-feminism does indulge in the fight against all unsustainable progress, unethical development projects, as well as the denial of equality and peace to women by destroying the wellness of the earth. Eco-feminists are 
eco warriors our soldiers are eco feminists are eco warriors who are sensitive to the perverse side of unsustainable development brought about by the techno economic race for material gain they alert humanity about the paradigmatic link between the exploitation of environment and that of women by man eco feminism asserts that all forms and structures of oppression are interconnected and that they should be countered as a totality so you you can see here uh, there is uh, domination but uh, i think questions are being asked but i'll answer the questions later um, uh, but you know there is there is injustice there is unethical practice everywhere so you can solve just one and claim that justice is established so it's a it's a totality of unethical practices so the oppressive and exploitative domination of nature as well as women by patriarchal power structures must be targeted together mindless colonialism which was exploitative in content and form exercised domination all over the world for centuries and established a greedy utilitarian strategy of killing life for the sake of sap of cultures peoples land nation and consequently women its flawed mistaken politics continues in overt and covert ways in hidden and you know in public way making every portion of the world a global market and turning majority of the population into consumers eco feminism is a resistance to materialism and which ignores the spirit and sustenance of the land with its animate and inanimate belongings materialistic techno economic development models are inherently structured on four things one hierarchy up middle down you know the kind of you know layer of power management two binaries dualism black and white you and i up and down master and slave so binaries three hegemony exerting force exerting domination exerting monopoly over those who depend on you hegemony exploitation squeezing all the benefits without thinking of the benefit or or or, or the sentiments of the of the of the other end patriarchal power is also functioning on these four wheels the four wheels of hierarchy binaries hegemony and exploitation so in a world where decision making power and wealth are all monopolized by man eco feminism opposes the twin domination of women and nature by man so man controls not only nature but also women so this twin domination this mode of domination is rooted in the concept of nature and culture as bina- as binaries so nature development nature in one compartment develop or nature opposes development or development opposes nature without with nature you can't have development with woman man is not power man cannot you know exert power man is not confident so this kind of a uh, uh, Op- uh, conceiving the relationship as opposing forces eco feminism both as theory and praxis aims at uprooting this perception and replacing it with an integrative inclusive and egalitarian vision vision based on equality that cuts down that pulls down the barrier between nature and development and holds them in a mutually empowering totality mutually empowering totality in a world where masculine qualities of reason and rationalism are glorified to condemn feminine qualities of intuition nurturing and caring and where culture attempts to control and dominate nature just as men universally control and dominate women eco feminism posits itself as a transformative force
ecofeminism has lent itself to an amazing plurality, plurality of discursive practices. So that is where you know, um, we feel a little difficult to uh, understand the whole thing. The, you know, uh, the diversity uh, and, and the you know, innumerous approaches to ecofeminism. So the, the plurality, so many of them, as a liberative and transformative ideology, it presents itself as a pragmatic, realistic, and socialist dynamics in discourses that expose the condition of women deprived of basic amenities of life. So in the case of women you know, who are deprived of the basic um, facilities of life, it's actually a liberative you know, uh, philosophy. The opening lines of the book, Longing for Running Water, Ecofeminism and Liberation. The title itself, you know, uh, discloses what it is about. See, this uh, ideological uh, discourse, well, decision making, who will decide whether I should buy 10 acres of land, uh, whether I should change all the rooms in the house to air condition. Well, these are things of a specific class, but water, right? just water to feed the children, to cook. So this kind of you know, basic necessities that think of the women who are deprived of that. How do you, how do you solve their issue with the eco-feminist perspective? That is a question. So this book, Longing, Longing for Running Water, Ecofeminism and Liberation by Sister Yon Jabara. This speaks for such a down-to-earth ecofeminism, proletarian, feminist, and deeply ecological. So it's, it's a more realistic kind of an attitude. And he, he, she says, I'm quoting, I see that ecofeminism is born of daily life, of day-to-day -day sharing among people, of enduring together, garbage in the streets, bad smells, absence of sewers, and safe drinking water, poor nutrition, and lack of adequate health care. For her, you know, ecofeminism is all these things, addressing these things. The ecofeminism I see is born of the lack of municipal garbage collection, of the, of the multiplication of rats, cockroaches, and mosquitoes, and of the sores on children's skins. You know, this uh, stinking um, uh, gutters and, you know, uh, the children suffering from all kinds of diseases. According to me, ecofeminism should uh, address this thing. That's what you're assessed. This sounds very much like an ecofeminist plea for the women in Somalia or the slums of Delhi and Mumbai but not so relevant to those in Birmingham or New York City. Here, ecofeminism becomes the semiotics of class distinctions in the liberation of women. Who benefits from ecofeminism? Where is it relevant? So that is a question. The spirit of this discourse is similar to Christian ecofeminism. I, I already told you the plurality of discourses. This is similar to Christian ecofeminism which combines spirituality with environmentalism and feminism. I'm quoting from Mary Gray. Christian ecofeminism is a fusion of the environmental movement, feminism, and woman's spirituality. It's a combination of environmentalism, feminism, and spirituality. It is also a spirituality which, quote, involves experiencing the world as sacred, held by sacred being, by God. God is not extraneous to the world, but the power of life, love sustaining and energizing this web of life, unquote. It yokes itself with liberation theology, which insists on Christian spirit and practice as the faith in God, who, quote, hears the cry and anguish of the poor. Liberation theology is a, is a very radical philosophy which came up in Christian thought by which Christ cared more for the poor, for the marginalized, and for the deprived. So Christianity should actually be uh, functioning 
for redeeming this section of people, the ills of those who are deprived of all the amenities and facilities of life. So this cry for the poor is basic to Christian ideology. According to this Christian ecofeminism, it actually takes a lot of the uh, uh, concepts, ideology of liberation theology. Christian ecofeminism views ecofeminism as reiterating this philosophical vision by contemporizing it, by making it relevant to our own times. Mercy, justice, and caring are needed for nature, which is suffering due to human cruelty and exploitation. Just like Christian liberation theology pleaded for the poor, it, in ecofeminism, Christian ecofeminism pleads for nature, nature as the deprived, nature as the marginalized, nature as the one which actually requires liberation. At present, the categories of poverty are stretched. Who is poor? What you call you could put within quotes as poor, that is extended, that definition is extended. I'm quoting again, um, Mary Gray. Nature is now the new poor. Nature is now the new poor. The mission and ministry of Christian religion is eco-feminized as, quote, inclusive of the suffering birds and animals, of land turned to desert and streams polluted and focused on the anguish of poor people sustaining life in these conditions. So not only on the endangered, destroyed, damaged nature, but also on those people who suffer because of the damage done to nature. That is the new poor. Ecofeminism has had its resonances in India. We are rich in ecofeminist motives. Ecofeminism has had its resonances in India, especially in the Chipko movement of 1973 in the Himalayan region of Uttarakhand, pioneered by, as you all know, Sundarlal Bahaguna. It witnessed women standing unmoved around trees, embracing them in order to resist the felling of trees, cutting down of trees, and consequent deforestation by government under the pretext of development projects. So to build dams, to have hydroelectric projects, okay, get rid of the forest, cut the trees. So against this, you know, uh, actually, you know, chipko means the Hindi word chipko means uh, to hug, to embrace, to cling. Chipko movement was led by Gauri Devi, a woman leader, and 27 other women of Reni village in Uttarakhand. It was a non violent social and ecological movement in Gandhian mode by rural people, by the village people, by the primarily women to conserve trees and forests. Chipko Andolan has had its offshoot as Apiko movement in the Uttara Kannada district in Karnataka state, where 81% of its geographical area had been once covered by forest, 81%, which has now shrunk to 25% by 1980. By 1980, it had shrunk to 25%. The local term in Kannada for hugging is apiko, just like chipko in Hindi. It was an uprising, uprising of the local people against the government's move to start industrial projects of paper mill, plywood factory, and a chain of hydroelectric dams for harnessing, for, for controlling the rivers. In 1983, men, women, and children of Salkani, uh, that particular village, stood hugging the trees in Kalei forest to save the forest, to save the forest, a pico and Olen generated a new awareness of environmentalism in Southern India and gave recognition to women as important role players in environment conservation. At the beginning of this paper, actually I've given uh, a, a, a dialogue. It's like a, it's like a folk song that the women, you know, as they hugged the tree, hugged the trees and stood there, they just sang this, these lines like, a, like in a dialogue, Forrester, what do the forests bear? Profits, resin, and timber. That's what the forest says. And women, they sing together, chorus. What do the forests bear? And they themselves give the answer. Soil, water, and pure air. Soil, water, and pure air. 
sustain the earth and all she bears, they cry. So that, that, this is the kind of folk song that I have placed as the motto of this paper at the beginning. Vandana Shiva, the Indian scholar, activist and eco-feminist founded Navdanya, an organization for protecting biological and cultural diversity. She fought against the disharmony caused by maintaining the illusion that humans are separate from nature, which she described as eco-apartheid. Just like you know, uh, the, the color discrimination in Africa, this is eco-apartheid. In her book, Eco-Feminism, which she co-authored with the German eco-feminist, Maria Miles. She wrote about an eco-feminism, which is a unified vision of Western and Southern feminism, accommodating under it environmental, technological, and feminist issues. Vandana Shiva believes that the Western practice of development serves only as maldevelopment for third world countries. She calls it maldevelopment for third world countries um, and calls for a restoration of a non-mechanical interaction between humans and environment. This had prevailed, this kind of a non-mechanical live relationship had existed in pre-colonial India. Well, there have been people who attacked her for this kind of, yes, for conven this conventional, traditional, you know, approach to uh, eco-feminism, uh, claiming that, you know, all that existed prior to British colonization, to, to colonization was all, you know, paradise and uh, very nice. So, Naturally, there, there is opposition to that. But she believed that there was a better relationship between nature and uh, woman. And uh, Bina Agarwal, uh, she's actually an Indian, but she's, I think she's in Yale University, in an American university. Um, she's actually an Indian development economist uh, and professor at the University of Manchester. Yeah, she's in England, in, in University of Manchester. And in her essay, The Gender and Environment Debate, Lessons from India, addresses this issue and analyzes the conceptual and practical aspects of ecofeminism in order to ascertain it, its relevance in India. She particularly focuses on rural tribal India and its environmental issues with their class and gender dimensions. She offers an alternative transformative concept, feminist environmentalism. Okay. She, she, she gives a different terminology, feminist environmentalism, in place of eco-feminism. According to Agarwal's thesis, the participation of women in the Chipko movement and similar acts of disadvantaged communities taking over environmental protection evidences the necessity for decentralized planning involving the rural poor, especially women, in decision-making relating to tree planting, scientific intervention in agriculture, and sharing of indigenous resources. So she's, an, she's a development economist, particularly relating to India. So she says, see, you cannot dismiss development, you cannot dismiss technology, but when you want to convert a forest area, when you want to build dams, you have to get the consent and you know, opinion of the people, of the women particularly, because they are closer to nature, um, you have to get the consent and decision and suggestion of the women. You don't have to take it as such, but this kind of an involvement of the local rural women in even the highest, you know, the most advanced development projects would balance, would balance the blind, mindless destruction of nature. Of course, uh, women may hug the trees, but at the same time, we can slowly release their hands if you convince them that the benefits that they are going to reap uh, would be really uh, empowering them. And also that there would be a check, there would be a check in this mindless activity of interfering with the sustainability of nature. So this is the kind of feminist environmentalism that Bina Agarwal is proposing. According to Agarwal's thesis, uh, as I said, you know, 
the participation of women in the Chipko movement and similar acts of disadvantaged communities, um, taking over environmental protection evidences, the necessity, that's what she focuses on, for decentralized planning. So not everything from, you know, we are just one fine morning we hear, okay, the government has decided. Instead of that kind of a centralized planning, decentralizing the planning, uh, uh, extending it to the opinion, uh, to the involvement of the local, the regional uh, people, particularly women. Rural poor, especially women in decision-making relating to tree planting, a, a, what kind of trees to be planted? You remember in Kerala, you know, once there was a mad move to plant e uh, eucalyptus all over. Uh, then the, there was also uh, another acacia trees. So, you know, uh, they're all mindless activities. So how to share the indigenous resources? What all indigenous resources, local resources, regional resources can be shared, can be given up for development? So the women have a say in the matter. This is a radical environmentalism, a grassroots perspective, focusing on the Indian socio-economic context and considering the legacy of women's indigenous resources for production, especially in agriculture, and the history of bold and successful environmental protection that the rural women in the Alt State. You know, the hard work put forward, you know, put in by women in agriculture. And also when it came to uh, deforestation, how boldly they put up this uh, fight as warriors. It is its own conceptual discourse and dynamics of action, this uh, um, uh, feminist environmentalism. Uh, it has its own conceptual discourse and dynamics of action in the approach to development. It addresses gender relations and relation between people and the non-human world. The outcome of this perspective is expected to be a de-gendering and de-classing of the relationship between humans and nature, whereby gender power and production processes and tradition and technology would support mutually, leading to an Indian development model appropriate universal. She says, this can start from our Indian uh, experience, Indian context, but this is something which can be applied universally. So here we are we are not you know um, uh, we do not we do not restrict you know feminism or environmentalism to one set of people, but we are going down to our, into the grassroots level because forests, nature, and grassroots level they are closely intertwined. So when you when you ignore when you ignore the grassroots realities. The, gra the, the, the grassroots level people, you actually, you know, uh, uh, destroy the whole um, sustainability of the development project. It involves a factual reckoning of productive production process. How do you really enter it? What are you going to do? Let people know a democratic process of informing, informing the people concerned about the production process, distribution of products. Okay, what are you going to get out of it? How do you distribute the outcome of this kind of a development project? Power and knowledge and the formulation of development strategies from a grassroots level, level reality. Instead of rejecting technology and development, a studied and realistic approach to the composition of the products, the technologies used for production, the processes that led to the decision relating to technology and product, the knowledge systems on which choices are based, and the class and gender distribution of products would facilitate a transformation in the relation between humans and nature, the ecological dimension, and man and the women, the feminist aspect. I'm quoting from Bina Agarwal. So for her, this will solve a whole lot of problems, particularly in the Indian context. Ecofeminism may not provide lasting final solutions to women's issues or environmental concerns. Nature belongs to men and women. The concept and action of development cannot completely avoid expanding the resources of nature. Women's well being and freedom cannot be confined exclusively to a condition of protected nature and environment. The independence and empowerment 
that technology has provided to women cannot be sustained by retreading to a machine-free, raw nature. So a balanced stance is imminent in ecofeminism. Alicia Pulio proposes. Now, Alicia Pulio or Puliane, she's uh, uh, very strong in her, you know, about her convictions. Uh, Alicia Pulio proposes a model called critical ecofeminism. Another, uh, you know, approach, critical ecofeminism. It is the theory which avoids with prudence the dangers that the renouncing of development, the benefits of the rationality of modernity and the products of technology entail for women. So she doesn't want to you know, absolutely say no to development. Critical ecofeminism is an updated version of ecofeminism in tune with the new millennium cha challenges, simultaneously committed to fulfilling the promises of liberty, equality, and solidarity of the enlightenment. As you know, enlightenment, you know, motives were this, liberty, equality, and also stand together, solidarity. Um, it involves a clear awareness of the great levels of welfare, as well as the destruction of the fabric of life that techno-scientific practices driven by modern rationality have brought about. So we need well-being. We need welfare state. So nothing that stands in the way of establishing well-being can be promoted. At the same time, it has to be sustained. So sustainability of our efforts for welfare, for progress, for development, plus the discrete choices regarding the development projects. Julio's proposal does not reduce ecofeminism to a mere anthropocentric feminist environmentalism that safeguards and manages the national resources wisely. Critical ecofeminism insists on women's freedom to take decisions relating to their body while rejecting the technological resources as elements of domination by capitalist to patriarchy. But patriarchy, conventional ecofeminism implies a return to the image of woman defined by her role as mother and nurturer. So that is the fear that critical ecofeminism raises. If you say no to technology, if you say, uh, uh, again, a mindless, blind no to development projects, woman may have to go back to her, you know, earlier dependent slavish, you know, nature, slavish state. So we have to, we have to safeguard her from such a state. Actually, that will never happen. But theoretically, um, uh, the, 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 the theoretical discourses may lead people to take such a defensive stance. While rejecting the technological resources as elements of domination by capitalist patriarchy, conventional ecofeminism implies, uh, willy-nilly, a return to the image of woman defined by her role as mother and nurturer. You can't limit the mother, the woman to just as a nurturer and a mother. Relating this role to her relationship with the nature becomes inevitably retrogressive. So if you confine her to that, then it will be a retrogressive, anti-progressive measure. Conventional ecofeminism, quote, conventional ecofeminism is an attempt to outline a new utopian horizon, addressing the environmental issue from the categories of patriarchy androcentrism, care, sexism, and gender." Unquote. The future of ecofeminism involves a clear stance in favor of women's access to free decision, decision making on reproduction, which requires a significant role of women in demographic matters like the control and sustenance of population. See, this is an issue that, you know, uh, it's very sensitive issue. We know about, uh, 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 see, embryonic destructions, um, killing of um, female embryos. So the, the freedom of the woman, even in population matters, in designing the texture and quantum of population, that's something basic. That is freedom regarding her body. See, nature is not just plants and trees. Nature is also the woman's body, everybody's body. 
the human body. So decision making, even you know, re relating to uh, her body, the handle, the the, util the use of a body, this requires the support of scientific knowledge and technology. See what she tries to say is, you can't say no to technology because for the health, for this kind of decision making, the woman needs a technology. So it is a philosophy which is neither technophobic, phobia means you know hatred. It's not technophobic nor technomaniacal. It's not technomania, it's not technophobia. The utilization of the innovations of science and technology should be examined in the light of human rights relating to health and healthy environment, the right to avail and sustain biodiversity, to avoid the sufferings of fellow beings and to leave the legacy of natural wealth to future generations. So the concern should be sustainability. What are we going to leave to the future? And also, are you considering human rights concerns in dealing with nature, in the utilization of technology? So that is very central to this um, uh, philosophy of uh, Pulio, critical ecofeminism. Instead of positioning on the opposing side against man and technology, a sense of belonging to the multiple and multiform life of our planet, well informed about the uses and harm of technology, is likely to charge ecofeminism with energy and ethics relevant to our times. No culture is perfect. Hence, an intercultural understanding of sustainable cultures that give importance to human rights and give special attention to women's rights and treatment of animals, which ensures an internationalist vocation is an integral part of critical ecofeminism. So it's a holistic approach. It takes into consideration all relationships and also taking lessons from other sustainable cultures. It could be you know, from the natives, from Red Indians, from tribals, from Adivasis. So take the lessons from them. It is an internationalist vocation, an integral part of critical ecofeminism. It calls for eco-justice and considerate understanding of the varied nature in the relationship between woman and nature across cultures and continents. The poor women of the so-called South and the third world countries suffer more when the natural resources are taken away from their environment in the name of development or urbanization. The rural women in India, depending on nature for subsistence, are forced to walk for more miles for collecting fuel wood because of felling of trees and deforestation. An instance of the rational exploitation aimed at international market by which the rich urban women may get the benefit of techno-economic development in terms of facilities that give her leisure, time, and freedom from domestic stress. It's a long sentence, I'm sorry for the length. No, the, 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 the point is that, you know, all these uh, things might develop, might, might benefit a particular section, the, the urban rich women. But you cannot call feminism, you cannot call such a, such a uh, development as a feminism or eco-feminism. So a critical approach to gender stereotypes like the self-denying women who resist mechanization for safeguarding environment is necessary. So um, hugging the trees, to prevent the deforestation, but hugging the trees, not to prevent development, but, but to actually give her a chance to take a decision regarding development. So for acquiring a culture uh, of sustainability, extremism of any ideology, feminism or environmentalism is likely to be a hindrance. So extremist approach is not going to help us. A wise balance needs to be struck between caring for nature and accepting developments, development modes facilitated by technology. It is a freedom that does not harm ecological well-being. Critical ecofeminism necessitates a reconceptualization of the human being as one who, quote, integrates reason and emotion, unquote. Integrating reason and emotion. Environmental education should include 
the precepts of critical ecofeminism and promote conviction about gender equality through ecology. A sense of fraternity comprising man, woman, and animals along with their habitat would fulfill the objectives of feminism as well as environmentalism. An ecological culture of liberty, equality, and sustainability is the objective of critical ecofeminism. On examining the different perspectives of ecofeminism, it is evident that a fully satisfactory concept that accommodates the women's issues and the environmental concerns in the contemporary globalized high-tech world is yet to be established. Perhaps it is in the evolutionary stage, but it is true that the socio-economic context in which women live is a crucial determinant in positioning women in conjunction with the nature ontologically as well as epistemologically. So which woman, where, in what context? What is the kind of relationship? So these things have to be you know, taken into account. Defining ecofeminism in the Indian context is highly problematic due to the following factors. One, we are such a huge country and the, di the, the diversities, biological, cultural, geographical diversities. Then two, the customs, beliefs, religions, practices, and daily life of Indians. It is so much connected with nature and our relationship with nature, we honor nature, we worship nature down the ages. It varies regionally across the country in one, uh, nature, in one region, it may be different in one, in another region, it may be still uh, different. So this kind of a difference, the ambition and planning for development and making India a global player in economic matters is a significant part of Indian politics and government at the central and state levels. There is a blind and unethical commitment on their part to development as a vote bank and financial resource. Vote and pressure. So eyeing the votes, you know, development projects are engineered. Fourth, tradition, heredity, family orientation, etc., have a great impact on the Indian woman's self and personality, which invariably block a complete avowal acceptance of feminism in spite of high educational qualification or high career status. As, as women who share this platform, this uh, forum, very well know that it's not easy for us. Uh, our, our tradition, our heredity, our past, our family orientation. The fifth one, there are several divides in India based on wealth, education, caste, class, and even digital ability. Now the digital divide is so clear. Um, think of the children who are deprived of education because they don't have the gadgets, the smartphones. Ecofeminism as concept and ideology has to tide over or accommodate these issues before getting acceptance in India. I'm coming to the last end. I would have loved to talk about literature, but I've been given by Professor Hebbar this topic, but I'm just concluding. Literary expression has always linked itself to nature in a symbolic manner down the ages. Ecofeminism has given a fresh energy and political dimension to women's literature. In fact, all aspects of ecofeminism figure as theme in the creative writing of all languages and nationalities in diverse forms and combinations. And I'm sure that Professor Tangamani would address this, you know, the rich, the rich content of Hindi literature um, regarding uh, environmentalism, ecofeminism, uh, et cetera. So, from natural feminism, which emphasizes the woman's intuitive bonding with the nature, to aggressive criticism of technology and its disastrous impact on nature. Sometimes our literature makes a violent disavowal of the development discourse as alienating women from human rights and human emotions. You know, speaking against uh, technology. Indian literature is, is plentiful in that. Eco criticism includes eco feminist vision and politics as significant characteristics. The interface of literature and ecofeminism provides a plethora of inputs for the cultural and psychological understanding of this ever evolving concept. According to me, because I'm not from the discipline of uh, sociology or philosophy, according to me, if you take you know, some literary works by women, they are, they are Bible for any kind of, you know, Eco-feminist uh, uh, theory, 
critical feminism or uh, spiritual feminism or whatever. You get everything in literature. Eco-feminist literature is a magnificent epistemological mix, realistic yet highly imaginative, often sailing in fantasy, explorative, reverential to nature, dismissive to technology, feminist and futuristic. Eco-feminist literature has enriched not only the literary, but also the conceptual resources of ecofeminism. That's why I said it's even a contribution to the theory of ecofeminism, a fascinating outcome of literature that genders the green and greens the gender. 